So the next speaker is my academic daddy, Laurent uh, Bernier, <laughs> who's going to talk about two applications of uh, the framework with the new class. Okay, can you hear me fine uh, on online? It's okay. Wolfgang, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, well, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. Um, great pleasure to be here. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to talk uh, about some recent work that I've been uh, doing with my young colleagues, uh, Valentino and Tomas. Uh, so, yeah, Valentino is in Siena. At the time, uh, Tomas was in Warsaw, but he's, uh, he's now uh, in Chile. Okay, so what I will be talking about uh, relates to <clears throat> some old story. And actually I realized while preparing the talk that really uh, it started for me uh, in 2009. That was the very first time I was uh, attending a Serum conference. And I usually don't remember what I had for breakfast, but uh, they, uh, this talk I remember very well. It was a, a talk uh, given by Bjorn. And he was, uh, the talk was entitled Feeble Subset. And the, talk, the, the results that Bjorn presented uh, was the following, that if you take a set which is random enough, and actually, you know, it turns out in his paper that two Schnorr randomness is enough, as he shows, then you have an infinite subset uh, which does not compute any not enough random, or sometimes I say one random. So there's a bit of an asymmetry. So if X is sufficiently random, there is an infinite subset, which if you, you lose so much information that you're, you're not able to recover any randomness from that subset. And at the time, that was only a conjecture. Of course, again, the result is a little bit, not ugly, but unsatisfactory. You would like to have the same randomness notion in the hypothesis and the conclusion, right? So you want to say that for every one random, for every mountain of random X, there exists an infinite subset which does not compute any one random, okay? At the time, this was unknown. But for the moment, I'm going to present uh, not the full proof, but like the, the idea of, of the proof uh, that Bjorn had, because it actually is really elegant and, um, and we're going to elaborate on, and we're going to you know, do more with it uh, in this talk. So it has really two parts. The first part is just uh, computability theory. And the result that Bjorn proved is you can build below zero prime, a three bushy tree, such that none of its path compute a mountain of random. Okay, so just a bit of terminology. Um, I say that the tree, is k bushy if every node has at least k children. Okay, so I mean, or perfectly bushy for an infinite tree. For finite trees, we can allow, uh, wh when we don't say perfectly, sometimes it uh, implies that you can have a leaf also. So in that case, being k bushy means either you're a leaf or you have k children. Um, but okay, in most of the, most of the stock, uh, for me, like k bushy is going to mean like an infinite tree such that every uh, node has at least k children. And you can generalize that to a function. If I give you a function, I say that the tree is F bushy and potentially you can have more and more, you know, branching speed, right? Or maybe, you know, uh, if, if F is linear, then you have like two children and three children and four children is, you know, your tree is going to, you know, grow linearly and, and you can go, you know, higher and higher and higher in this hierarchy. Okay, and so the technique to prove the step one this is complicated, but I can just give the idea, right? We're gonna use the so-called bushy tree forcing. So you basically construct uh, bushy trees by a, a, a forcing. So you use finite trees. So this time, yeah, of course you're allowed to have these because they're finite trees, right? So you use like finite bushy trees. And then you, you can have this um, idea that some sets of strings can be small, basically small if something is small, if you can, you, you, you can, um, construct a bushy tree while avoiding them. So there is this delicate notion of like K big, K small in bushy trees. Again, uh, this is a big combinatorial. I do not have time to recall everything, but basically what you do is you have two things. You're, you're building a tree that you're trying to make bushy, and then you're trying to avoid a small set, small in the sense of bushiness. 
okay like the forcing uh, extension is what you expect so you uh, your condition extend another one if your tree extends your previous tree and potentially you're allowed to you make your sets of uh, of things to be avoided a bit bigger okay so that's like the uh, so I won't say much more, but I very much invite you, uh, if you're interested in bushy tree forcing, to read this paper uh, by Joe and Mushvek, uh, which is really a jewel. Uh, it tells you pretty much all you need to know about bushy tree forcing. Like, I've probably read it like three or four times, and every time you learn something new, it's really an amazing paper. So uh, I refer you to this paper for more on the bushy tree forcing. Okay, and it turns out that you, when you're trying to um, make a tree to avoid computing modulus of random, the complexity of your sets B to be avoided is their CE sets. So basically, at the, when you do forcing, you have this dichotomy. It's like, okay, I've built my bushy tree, my finite bushy tree. I'm looking at new functional, and I'm asking, is this functional defined on a big set or on a small set? If it's defined on a big set, then kind of by the pigeonhole principle, there is a string that is computed by a, a big subset of strings. And this string must be simple because, well, I'd say you take the first one that you see in, in, in that case. And well, because it's, a, it's, a, it's a easy to describe, it should be not not enough random. It should have some randomness deficiency. So either your functional is defined a lot behind what you've already constructed, in which case you find by the pigeonhole principle, you find a common string, which is computed by still a lot of nodes and then you extend to that and so all of your children compute something not very random or your functional is defined only on the small set and then you try to avoid it then you 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 add it to your excluded set you say okay my functional is going to be defined on the small set and so defined for like some finite part and so basically this is a c set that you're trying to avoid you say is my functional defined up to say blah and that's a c question so in the forcing to build a bushy tree, which does not compute, uh, the path do not compute any modulus of random, the C sets, uh, the, the, the sets to be voided are, are CE. And so you can basically do this construction. Every step of the construction is a zero prime question. You're asking, is my functional up to blah defined on a big set or large set? This is a C question. Okay, so use your prime and you can perform the bushy tree construction. But that's not the only way. You can do that. Of course, you can use your prime, but you can do other things. Okay. And this is what uh, I will be talking about. Um, oh, the title is wrong. Sorry. So, uh, step two now that we have this bushy tree, we're just going to forget about computability theory for the moment. We're just going to do just probabilities. Okay. And what is this probabilistic argument? It's quite nice. So now you have an infinite ternary tree, where that's my three bushy tree. And for each node, individually, independently of all the others, you just flip a coin. Heads, you remove that node. Tail, you keep it. Okay. And the claim is that with positive probability, uh, there is a path which is not destroyed by this process. Like all of the nodes from this path uh, stay intact. And why is that true? Well. It's because if you think of it as in, term, in terms of survival, right? Once a, once a node is removed, you can think of for survival of path that you know, all, of the, all, all of its uh, children and descendants are removed at the same time, right? So when you think about who survives in this process in, in, in terms of path, it's just a Galton-Watson process, right? You have like, so Galton-Watson is like a branching process in probability theory. So you start with a node and then you're going to have a number of children picked at random with some distribution, right? So here we have three children, but we're going to kill, sorry, it's not the, um, we're going to like with positive, with probability one half, each of them gets removed uh, with probability one half. So you have three of them. So basically it means that with probability one eighth, you will produce three children with probability one eighth, zero children, and then three eighth, three eighth, four, one and two. Okay, and then you start again. Right? That's a branching process. Once you've created a child, this child itself will have one child with probably three eight, two child three eight, zero one eight, three children one eight. Okay, and you start over, right? And the question, and that's that was the the Galton Watson 
question is like, okay, what is the condition? Uh, because of course here are specific parameters, right? But what is the condition in general for that process to go on forever or at some point uh, it terminates, right? Like I've, uh, all, the, all the nodes have produced zero children. And well, the answer is, well, pretty straightforward. Actually, it's just a, a matter of expectation. So as long as your expectation is greater than one, uh, your process may go on forever. Of course, you, you always have a small chance that it stops. You can get unlucky. You have like, as a generation, you have like 12 nodes. They can all get unlucky and that they can always stop. At any point of time, the process might stop. But a positive probability of going on forever, it's just about having uh, uh, an expectation greater than one. And actually it's an if and only if, if the expression is smaller or equal to one, uh, you will terminate almost surely, except in the very degenerate case where you have like one children, one child with probability one at every step. That's a very degenerate case. But if you remove that, it's, this, this is an if and only if. Your infinite survival has positive probability, if and only if uh, your expectation is strictly greater than one. Well, here we're good, right? We have three children. That's why we need three bushy and not two bushy. Right? We have three children, remove each of them with probability one half, expectation three half, right? This is greater than one. So uh, there is a positive probability that the, the process will go on forever. And that second step, okay, now that we've done the hard work like to understand the probability theory behind it, that the effectivization is straightforward, right? So now if you uh, take a, a perfect ternary tree, you number, it's nodes with integers, you code them with an integers. And then you just take a Schnorr random. The Schnorr random is going to tell you which node to, to remove and which node to keep, right? It's going to be your, your sequence of, co of coin flips. And then you look at the intersection of X with T. Well, the translation of the classical argument into the effective argument is that uh, X intersect T is going to contain a path as long as you allow for some finite change on X, because of course, yeah, maybe you get unlucky, maybe the root gets removed, or maybe your first level gets removed. But if you're okay to change, uh, to, 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 to change your decision on, this, on some finite part, then you're going to keep a path in your tree. Okay, so that's why I have an X star and not an X. And that does it. Now you finish the proof, you take a zero prime computable ternary tree, none of the path computes a random, you take a Schnorr random, and that's where the two Schnorr randomness happens, right? You take X to be Schnorr random relative to this tree, this tree is zero prime computable, so you need two Schnorr random, you will make the, your intersection modulo finite change, and well, it is a subset of your, uh, of your original X, right? Because you intersect it with T, and it does not compute any one random because it, it just codes a path, right? Well, you, you select a path, um, Oh yeah, no, sorry, I, I put X intersect T. No, 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 it's not X intersect T. It's the path through X intersect T, which is a desired subset. Sorry, there's a, a mistake. Uh, it's the path, we choose some path, any path through X intersect T. We know there is one, it has one. So you take that, you don't take the whole X intersect T, you take the path, right? And this path does not compute any one random and it is a subset, right? A path is a subset of the tree. So it's a sub, the subset, it's a subset of X intersect T, right? And it does not compute any one random. Okay, yeah, so sorry, there's a, there's a typo there. All right, well, it turns out that in fact, the full result is true. So that took 10 years, uh, at least to be published. I think they, they had the result before, but it, it, it got published very recently. So still Bjorn and our next speaker, they did prove that the, the, the results will hold in full generality. So if you take a one random X, there is an infinite subset Y such that Y does not compute any one random. But the proof is much harder. Uh, originally we tried to, uh, it, my co-authors, we tried to look at that paper and it was pretty dense. Uh, there's some beautiful stuff in there, but uh, definitely not uh, an, an easy proof. So today I'm going to give a different approach. And for that, we're going to use the uh, so-called fireworks machinery. Hence the title. So um, probably a lot of you here have heard me uh, give a, at least one talk about fireworks. I've given many uh, in recent years where I explain like why we call it fireworks and the fireworks shop, et cetera, et cetera. 
I do not want to sound like a broken record, so I will leave that aside for now. If you've never heard about fireworks argument, I can explain that during the free time, but I'm not going to explain why we call it fireworks and how it exactly works. But just like basically what fireworks arguments are is just a template to do forcing, probabilistic forcing. It's like effective as long as you have access to some uh, you know, random source in a way, right? So, uh, Originally, it was phrased, uh, if you read, for example, in, uh, in Dennis and Rod's book, uh, it's phrased as measure risking. So, and that was what Couts used to prove right, this pretty amazing result. I always, I'm always very fascinated by this result. Like every two random computes a one generic, which is really an exciting and surprising result because really randomness and genericity have nothing to do with each other. Right? If you just go a little bit higher, if you take a two random and a two generic, they form a minimal pair, right? So very quickly, in the hierarchy, like random and generics want nothing to do with each other, right? But at lower levels, you have interesting things that happen. Like for example, uh, you know, every generic is computed by a random, that is you know, the Kuchera gatch. And every, even every two random computes a one generic, this is right, surprising and this is Kaus's result. And if you look at Kaus's argument and as long as you understand how the fireworks you know, machinery works because actually it's not completely straightforward from the original proof to extrapolate, but uh, fortunately, Sasha and Andrei Rumyantsev uh, wrote a paper explaining really what is the probabilistic mechanism behind it. And so you can really, once you, under once you understand that, you can generalize it to a computable order. So now you take just some order. So for counts, it's just finite strings and the prefix order, right? That's what, the, what we use for to build the one generic. But now you just take any order which you can code by some integer and the order needs to be computable or even like C it will work, right? Then if you have access to a two random, then you can compute a generic sequence, which is like a decreasing sequence of conditions such that now for every subset W of P, uh, should be both, should be uh, math DDP, uh, for every subset, either you meet it or you avoid it no matter what. Right? It's just a forcing. You just force to be in W or you force to be outside of W. Right? So it's just a very straightforward generalization of the construction because you don't, it's nothing specific in Kautz's result about you know, finite strings and extension of finite strings. In fact, you don't really need two randomness. So that was an open question that we solved with uh, Chris Porter. Uh, it's enough to have demut randomness for people who like, you know, fine analysis in the between one random and two random hierarchy. Demut randomness is really what you want, right? So um, for most applications, demut randomness will be enough. Okay, and the good thing is bushy tree forcing is somewhat amenable to fireworks because uh, with a tiny subtlety, but more or less it's okay, uh, the order is computable. Like when you, when you make your construction of like avoiding a not enough random, uh, this is a construction where, you know, your decision uh, is a, like you have two candidates, like either it's small or it's big and like that's kind of a computable order, right? And so we use that with Ludovic, uh, for example, using fireworks that uh, we could build a DNC function. We build a, a sufficiently bushy tree uh, below two random to build some DNC function, which does not compute a one random. Because it was known that there exists a DNC function which does not compute any one random. But in fact, such a thing can be produced random, uh, at random using a two random. Actually here you really need two random. Demut randomness will not be enough. I said demut is enough for fireworks, but in fact, in argument with Ludovic, it's like fireworks with a little extra it's like fireworks plus a bit more randomness and that more randomness needs two randomness. So you really need two randomness for this result. But for a lot of other uh, fireworks arguments, demut is enough. But uh, yeah, I just want to, uh, to put it out there in case you say, oh, but I know that demut is not enough. Yes, yes, demut is not enough for this result because you need a bit more than fireworks. But mostly, yeah, at, at the core of our argument is this. It's not quite how we phrased it, but more or less that's what our proof shows is like we can build below a two random, a perfectly bushy tree. So as explained, as bushy as we want, and a small C and a sequence of small C sets. I say, okay, like these small sets, we need to avoid them. So we build the tree and we have these C sets that are just floating. We don't know where they are, we just know they're just they're small. Yeah. It's a function. 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's a function. Which, uh, yeah. So we have this tree, and we produce a list of C sets. We we don't know where they are. We just need we, we just need we just know we need to avoid them. But yeah, we just know they're small. And basically, uh, the, that's why we need a second layer of randomness. And then you just select a path randomly through the tree. So in our construction, the path gets selected at the same time as the construction. So it's a bit different setting, but more or less, this is what we do. Right? And this is why the second, the second layer of randomness needs two random because you need to avoid, you need to be, to, to avoid some small C sets. Right? These C sets are zero prime computable. So basically that's what you need to random. Right? And the important thing is H can just be as fast growing as you want, has to be a computable function, but you can just take it as, as you know, fast growing as you want. And the BI, they can be as small as you want relatively to the, to the function H. So, okay, back to the, or back to the Kyosansen and use result. How do we do that? We take a one random, this time really a one random, not a two no random. Now you take a two random Z, such that X is one random relative to Z. You can do that by von Lombardian. And below Z, Z, uh, you can just do fireworks. Z is too random, so you do a firework. You construct your H Gucci tree such that except for a small, uh, except for a small C set, some small C set, like none of the path computer one random. And then you intersect T with your X. And you argue once again, because the, your, 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 your sets are small that still, they don't cost you a lot in terms of, of bushiness. You should still have a path which avoids the C sets. And so once again, there is a typo. It's not X, or Z, it's this path. The path through X intersect T is a path which avoids uh, all the small sets. And so you take that path and that's your, uh, and that's your why. That's the why you want. And we were looking at this. So first of all, we were, you know, quite happy that we have a probably a slightly simpler proof. And also we said, okay, maybe we get a little more, right? Because remember, I said like the Galton Watson, and it's the same goes for bushiness. You can just do that with Schnorr randomness, right? So we say, okay, well then take X to be Schnorr random. Then you take a two random Z, which is Schnorr random relative to Z. So that X is still Schnorr random relative to Z. And then you do the same construction, right? And that's suppose we're like, yeah, well, uh, really? Can we actually do that? That's not completely obvious. If we take a, a Schnorr random, are we sure that we can just take some two random, which preserve the, 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 the Schnorr randomness of, of our X, right? We know with for Martin of randoms because we have von Lombalgen, but we uh, know thanks to Yu Liang, that we do not have von Lombalgen for Schnorr randomness. So we were like, okay, is it true that if X is Schnorr random, then for almost all Y, X is going to stay random relative to Y? Should be true, right? Well, uh, and of course you can ask for like partial computable randomness, computable randomness, all these notions that live under not enough random that do not satisfy von Lombalgen. You can ask the same question for them. <laughs> well, it turned out to be no. This is not the case. Uh, these notions, uh, not only do they fail von Lombalgen, but they fail it like rather strongly, right? The answer is no to this question. For Schnorr, for computable randomness, for partial computable randomness. And that merits uh, a story of its own. So this is the second part of my talk is how do you, uh, how do you construct such things? Okay, so let's just, for the moment, let's leave Schnorr randomness uh, on the side, let's just say I asked a question for Schnorr randomness, computable randomness, partial computable randomness. So let's focus on computable randomness. It's just a bit nicer notion. So if you have a, a, real, a real X and you're asking, is it Y computably random relative to most Y? Basically what you're asking is that you're asking about probabilistic martingale. Right? You're saying, okay, I'm looking at martingales that take some random Oracle Z and are going to use this Oracle in order to, to make prediction. And we, we're asking, that this martingale over the Z that you use for you know, giving you a, a source of random bits, you want that with positive probability, your martingale is total. That's the condition for computable randomness and it succeeds on X. So when I say total, it means like total, total, not just on X, right? It needs to be total everywhere, right? So with positive probability, you want to be total and you want to succeed on, on X. That's the same question. But that's kind of interesting because 
it actually relates to something that has already been studied. Uh, Sambas and Niaminas uh, studied that very question, but just in a, in a slightly different setting. They were asking on top of that, that this probabilistic Martingale, so really a mod, you can imagine like a Martingale, like you have two kinds of randomness. Your Martingale wants to make some bets, but it has access to a coin. So it makes like, you know, like random decision. And they use that coin to make decision, right? But they, they were looking at, uh, at that question with the, an extra condition. They say, oh, the Martingale must bet and must be total like all the time with probability one relative to that secret coin you're using. Right? I know it should also with probability one or at least positive probability succeed on X. Okay, so stronger condition. And in that, in that setting, uh, no, that doesn't change anything. Like that, if, if, you, if you really ask for this strong condition, it's just computable random. So it is equivalent to be computably random and that Martingales that are randomized with this extra condition that you, you must be total with probability one, uh, succeed on X with positive probability, same notion. Uh, why? Well, basically because when your Martingale is total with probability one, you can just compute the average. That, that, that expectation here is just a Martingale. You can do the math well because the, 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 the fairness condition is just a, it's just a linear condition, right? So it's preserved under taking the integral, right? So if you have a total computable Martingale, uh, well, it's just computable randomness. Yeah, you need to you know, do a one or two computations more, but more or less, this is the idea. Well, that doesn't work. Uh, when my dz can be partial here because your, your integral is no longer computable, it just breaks down completely. It just it really doesn't work. You really need d to be uh, total with probability one for this to work. And indeed, we get the opposite result. So this was uh, what we proved uh, with Valentino and Tomas is you have, in the strongest sense, so you, in, in my hierarchy of, of notions, you know, you have like Schnorr random, computable random, partial computably random. We have one which is maximally random, so partial computably. But if you, if you allow random oracles, it's not even uh, Schnorr random relative to a random oracle. So that, that, sh that answers all the three questions negatively in, in, you know, in one stroke. And how do we do that? Well, we use firework, believe it or not. And what forcing notion? Well, we just force over martingales. We, we, we look at generic martingales. So we have, uh, as forcing notion, we have this finite martingale. So what is a finite martingale? Well, we, you start with capital one, and then you just need to distribute to, let's say the rational value and positive, you must never go broke, that's important. And you just need to respect the fairness condition. So your, your order is just finite, Martingales, you stop at some, you know, at some move. And the obvious uh, forcing extension, just one Martingale extends an order. And so basically, uh, this order is completely computable. It's just as simple as, you know, extensions of finite string, more or less it's that, right? Plus this extra fairness condition. <laughs> and now you can talk about a generic Martingale uh, in that setting. And well, because you have the fireworks machinery, below every two random, you can compute a generic Martingale. But what, what, why are they good? That's not obvious yet. Well, the question is, okay, how would, do we normally build uh, a partial computer random? How do, you, uh, how do you construct a real which defeats all partial computable martingales? Well, of course, <laughs> you, can, you can say, okay, I take a martin of random and that's that. Well, this, because martingales, they should not succeed against uh, martin of random. So yeah, of course that's one way. But typically if you read like, for example, in Andre's book, if you want to see like how you build something which is partial computably random, but not not enough random, what do you do? Well, you're going to just take an effective listing of all your partial uh, martingales. And what you do, you just take the first one for the moment, just one martingale, and you diagonalize against it. So what does that mean diagonalizing against the martingale? It's just, you play exactly your like, uh, like a very uh, a cheating casino, you just play exactly the opposite of what the gambler is saying. Here, your martingales are just, there, there is no probability, probability, right? They're just deterministic martingales, right? They just tell you what they're going to bet on. Well, you just look at D1, and as long as it's defined, you uh, go exactly uh, in the opposite direction. If it bets any money on zero, you produce a one. If it bets money on a one, uh, you, you play zero. If it doesn't bet, you do what you want. Okay, so you basically just do exactly the opposite. You try to, uh, uh, 
defeat D1, and you can do that for a very, very long time. So you just diagonalize against D1 as long as you want. Okay, at some point, you're gonna need to start caring about D2. So at some stage, again, any stage that you want, as late as you want, you're going to take Martingale D2. You're just going to pretend that it has not bet uh, without lo loss of generality. You assume that you know it hasn't done anything so far. It just enters the casino with some money and you're going to, with $1, and you're going to scale it down. You say, okay, instead of giving you $1, I'm just going to give you like one half a dollar. And now you're going to have the same method against not D1 on, alone, but D1 plus half D2. You treat them as just one player, right? The sum of martingales is a martingale. So you just treat them as one player overall, and you diagonalize against them, uh, against that uh, virtual player. You just make this uh, generalized player <clears throat> lose money at each stage. <clears throat> and, you, and you continue on every time you add uh, the player di and you give it one over two to the i in a way that uh, the <clears throat> there is some increase in the total amount of money because every time you add a new player, you add a tiny bit of capital, namely what this new player is bringing, but the total sum of added capital will never go above two. And when, you may, and, and when you don't add a player, you just make a move, you just make a zero or one move, they lose money. So the total capital is going to stay below two at all times, right? Because the only increases can come from a new player entering the equation. Okay, you might say also, oh, okay, but at some point, these DI, the they're partial, right? So maybe at some point, some DI is going to be undefined. It's not gonna bet anything, it's just going to just, you know, go in a loop. Well, that's fine because again, you're doing that against uh, at each stage, you're taking care of finitely many martingales. So you just register that, you know, and then you say, okay, now I ignore you. you you're undefined, well, just leave. <laughs> and then you continue, right? That's fine. That will only happen finitely often. So not a problem. <clears throat> okay, so now if we look individually at each phase of the construction, so you're dealing with finitely many pairs and as long as you want, you're diagonalizing against them. Well. It, this is a completely computable process. As long as you have a finite set of martingales, you, you follow, you're following a computable path. Not uniformly computable because at some point some martingales can stop betting. Well, this is a zero prime question. So you don't know, but let's say that somebody tells you, oh, this one has stopped betting. Well, that's only a finite am amount of information. So once you know like, you know, which of them have stopped betting, ultimately you're just following a computable path, right? So basically what your construction looks like and this is why in the end, your real will not be not enough random, is you're following a computable path for a long time. So O of log N complexity, right? computable, a computable sequence as logarithmic complexity. Then at some point, a new Martingale enters and you still follow a path and you have logarithmic complexity for a long time and then logarithmic. So basically you're, you're going to be logarithmic times something as small as you want. And this is exactly what you will find in Andre's book. It's like, you know, H of N times log N for H as slow growing as you want. And that comes from that construction. Right, logarithmic plus, you know, you have your first logarithmic plus a little bit, plus a little bit, plus a little bit. <clears throat> okay, but that's good news because our generic martingales are quite good at uh, defeating this computer path. If you stay, if you, if you have a computable sequence and you have a generic martingale, so you know generic is like, you know, you get a chance infinitely often to act on something. So you have this computable path and your martingale should win a lot of money on it. So Martingale, again, it's like you're, you're, you're defining where all your bets go on all strings, right? And so if you have your finite Martingale and you have this computable path and you say, oh, well, you know, I give you this computable path, at some point it's a C condition. I say, oh, now I want you to win a lot of money. Say like I number my, uh, my computable path my, for my path RE. I say, okay, I want you at some point on that computable path at some, at some position N to win more than N. Well, that is a dense condition because of course, if you start waking up here, maybe you've lost a lot of money so far, but you ask, you be, you're being asked along this computable path, you should reach a linear amount of money. You can always do that because if you now say, okay, I'm going to gamble everything I have on that path, you're going to win exponentially. So no matter how low you were before, if you now wake up and you're trying to bet on that path specifically, your capital is going to start growing exponentially. So you're going to in particular beat say like linear, like at position NE, you're going to get more than any. Anything below two to the NE, you can do. I say like NE square if you want. It's it's irrelevant in the book, but something that you can you know bound from below uh, as a function of NE. Okay, 
So it seemed like it's good enough. Well, not quite, because typically um, when you use a fireworks argument, you're just building your generic thing at random and you say, oh, I'm happy. But the problem here is that there is a problem of what happens first, right? You're first building your multi at random and you're first building your X and then some, and, and then some multi is going to be generated at random. And it, uh, you're not staying on that path forever, right? You need, when you, when you were in the, in the face of, a, of your construction, when you diagonalize against the set of multi yes, you stay on the computable path, but at some point you need to deviate from it. And there is an NE here. So it could be that you just decide to leave too early and different Martingales will have their different NE. So that's not really good. Yeah, this N, it depends on this NE. Uh, it depends on E, it depends on D as well. So there is a problem, but it can be fixed because now if you view the fireworks as just a functional, it takes some random choices and it induces, it, it generates, you know, it generates with positive probability, generates a generic Martingale. So now you can just look at this set of generic Martingales that are generated at random. And well, this functional, it just puts a distribution on them, not a computable distribution, not a probability distribution, because some of them also won't be generic and some of them won't even be defined, right? A, a fireworks uh, argument never gives you something with probability one, it gives you something with positive probability, as close to one as you want, but never one. So you have, a, a, you have your, your fireworks argument, it generates something generic with positive probability and something else. So now you just focus on these generic ones. And then you, you look at the push uh, forward measure induced by your functional, which performs a fireworks argument. And well, that's a measure, measure in the general, in the classical sense. And now you can just now each of the NE that are proper to the D, well, there is, you know that for every D in that set, there is an, a little NE which is good enough. Well, you just take a, you just take an NE large enough such that the probability, the psi probability of a Martingale to need more time than that is very small. So basically your NE that you pick is going to be good enough for most Martingales in the psi sense. Okay, so there's a bit of like, there's randomness a bit everywhere here. There's fireworks and there is, uh, so it's, it's like for most uh, random Martingales, your NE is good enough that if you stay on the path RE for NE steps, it will allow the Martingale uh, to win more than any. And now you use this unique sequence NE of, of integers to perform your construction. Every time you, you enter a phase and you're going to stay on the path RE, you stay for this big NE amount of time. And it's going to make most Martingales uh, do well on that section. So this basically like how to, do we pick a sequence to be fast growing enough? Well, this, this is using this measure. All right, well, that's what we do. So now you have a positive chance, again, in the Xi sense on your generic Martingale that for infinitely many E, not all E, of course, because you know, like it's only the REs that you follow during the construction. Your construction does not follow all computable paths. It follows some very specific, specific computable paths that are uh, used to diagonalize against Martingales. But for all of these computable paths that you follow, your Martingale is going to achieve capital more than NE at stage NE. So that's linear progress. And well, that's, tip, that's exactly, that's the characterization of, Schnorr, of Schnorr randomness with Martingales. If infinitely often you succeed better than some computable bound, which tends to infinity, you're not Schnorr random. So that means that the X, the single X that we fine tune to be, you know, very weak for random Martingales, this X has a positive measure of Y such that for the functional gamma that realizes the fireworks argument, we have a positive chance that you get a, a Martingale which defeats you in the Schnorr sense, like lin linearly well, like it will, it will beat you linearly infinitely often. So you're not Y Schnorr random relative to a positive measure of Y. So that's our proof. So, okay, so well, the conclusion of that is, well, there we have to welcome new zoo members, right? Now, of course, now that we know that it is not true for a, a Schnorr random, a computer random, and AE uh, partial computer random uh, to be not de-randomized almost surely, well, then we need to introduce this new notion. So now we have almost everywhere Schnorr randomness, almost everywhere computer randomness, 
almost every partial randoms and possibly more. And well, basically you have a template like AE blah random means that your Y blah random for almost all Y. And you can do that. At least you, could, you should try to do this for all notions that fail von Lombardian and see what happens. Right? For example, AE Martinov random gives you nothing more. It's just Martinov random because there is von Lombardian. But if, if your notion of randomness fails von Lombardian theorem, then you should at least, I, we haven't done that. The, the zoo is very big, but you should look at all notions uh, and see if really they are different or not. Because again, I've, somehow that never been studied for Schnorr and computable randomness, and this is quite, uh, quite natural. And well, at least these newcomers that we have identified, well, they behave exactly as you expect them to behave. So uh, they, of course, the AE version is stronger than the non-AE version. So you're asking to be random plus random relative to most oracles. So of course, an AE random, uh, AE blah random implies blah random, but everything else uh, fails. And they're also strictly weaker than Martinov. You can still construct some of them with you know, quite low complexity. You just need to deal with probabilistic Martingale instead of uh, deterministic Martingale, but it doesn't really cost you much more in complexity. So you still have things of logarithmic complexity that are AE partial computably random. So we don't have quite what we were hoping for originally, but we still have a tiny, tiny improvement over the Hyosansen and use and use result. Now, it's, instead of asking X to be one random, you say, okay, it's enough to be almost everywhere is not random, each not random. Then you have some infinite subset, which does not compute a one random, but it's still a little bit of a, again, a ugly, or at least, you know, not uh, perfectly good looking uh, theorem because you would want to have some symmetry. So the question would be, okay, then can we make Y to have this, the same level of randomness as X, or even can we, you know, we just thought we had it for Schnorr, at least if X is Schnorr, then some subset does not compute a one random. Can we at least go down uh, there? Well, or we failed to do so because we needed to add A E Schnorr random for that to be true, to make our fireworks argument. Uh, so it would be actually interesting to have the opposite, like to have a Schnorr random such that every infinite subset computes a one random. That could possibly be true because Schnorr randomness is weird. You have things that you, you know, that you don't expect to be random to still be Schnorr random and still have a lot of computational power. Uh, it could very well be the case that there is a, a Schnorr random such that every infinite subset computes a, a one random, or at least a Schnorr random, maybe. We have no clue because really our argument is entirely predicated on the fireworks method. So, um, yeah, I don't know. So, I will, uh, thank you very much. And I would like to say that it's wonderful to see you all after two years. It's my first meeting, and we hope to uh, see you in Paris in June. We're going to organize a conference. It's just a teaser. Dennis, uh, who is the main organizer, is going to give you the, the full uh, speech, but we will have a, a, a meeting in Paris uh, early June. So I hope to see you all there. So thank you. Thank you very much for the I don't know that much about the weirder part of the randomness thing, but do you, do you have any randomness notions that often do the weirder part? Oh, yeah. That were studied previously that, that could be the same area in your. Well, first of all, I mean, you, you could also you could also look at like, there is no reason to necessarily look below Martin of Random, uh, be above Martin of Random. I'm like. Demut randomness, weak to random, uh, Oberhofer, balance random, uh, and still below you still have the, the church stochastic, and none of, none of that is linearly ordered, right? If you Google like randomness zoo, you'll see that, yeah, there is like, when I started my PhD, it was more or less like a straight line. And then, you know, uh, by the time I even finished it, it was like, not completely uh, exaggerating, but it was kind of like, there was this like set of notions that were pretty well ordered. And uh, now it's just like, uh, Copies. But it doesn't actually matter whether it's out, you know, on this linear line. It's really whether Van Lombargen works on them or not. And, and that is messy. Yeah. It doesn't really have anything to do with the strength of the notion. Yeah. Mm.
Um, well, it's a bit more complicated because again, now you, you, you're dealing with Tosh, like, uh, you're dealing with probably sync marking else, but it's like approximating the integral well enough that you can do your diagonalization. So it's a bit harder, but it's not the, it's not definitely not the hardest part of the work now. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, there you go. Then like a prime. So, okay. So it does a lot better than that actually. So quartz random. Yeah, that's way, way, way below Schnorr random. So every quartz random has a subtype which is a computer random. Okay, well, there you go. Then uh, immediately answers my, uh, my open question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Laurent, can you hear me? Yes. Um, can you show again the formal definition of this AE computably random? I think there was an issue. Of uh, well, it's just uh, your AE computably random is for almost all Y, your AE, uh, your, your computably random relative to Y, just in the, in the, in the, but, in the usual sense. But did you require that the, that the martingale that does not depend on the oracle? Of course, it depends on the oracle. So for every oracle, we can take another martingale. Sorry. So, so you so you are not random for almost all oracles, but you have one old, one martingale doing that, or you have for every yeah, well, oracle. Yeah, you have one have oracle martingale. martingale that will do that, right? If you you know one of the gammas, one of the possible functional is going to work with positive probability, so you're going to have a, a single probabilistic martingale that will work with positive probability. Right? It's just it's probability as close to one, but not with probability one. And not 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 one, yeah. In, in okay, then then. Uh, right. Let's remember the slide. Thanks. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you.